do any of us have the same values as one another? The answer is incredibly simple. We don't. But you already knew that. In retrospect, I feel kind of stupid for saying it. Not only because it's an incredibly simple question to answer, but because that question isn't the one I actually want to answer. The real question, and the one I've wanted to answer my whole life, is how do we understand others' values? In simpler terms, how do we understand other people? This is a lot more complicated, of course. But there is one set of games that tries to answer this question. Games that remind you to live in the moment. Hello people of the world, and welcome to a video series that aims to answer that question by exploring The World Ends With You and Neo The World Ends With You. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, don't worry. This first video is aimed at all levels of interest in what I'm now abbreviating to Twiwi and Neo Twiwi. Because saying the full title each time I have to say it will double how long I talk your ears off. This video is a general overview of both games, and there's no forms of major spoilers, so you can learn or reminisce about what makes the game so great. Given time, I hope to give each game its own respective spoiler video though. These will hopefully answer the question by seeing what exactly these games have to say about how people can understand each other. Of course, unpacking the games in terms of the question is also an excuse for me to yell come and get some hot stuff about one of my favourite things of all time. They won't be for everybody, and if you have something that's impacted you in the same ways that these games have me, I'd love to hear about it. But if this video sounds like your cup of tea, or coffee, or coke, I guess in my case water, then I'd be grateful if you could stick around to listen. The housekeeping's out the way though, so it's time to dive in. What an awful affliction. Onward I die! Out of my face! You're blocking my view! Shut up! Stop talking! Just go the hell away! All the world needs is me. I got my values. So you can keep yours, alright? I don't get people. Never have, never will. The beginning of Twiwi shows us a young boy wearing headphones, walking through a thriving city full of lively, different people. He isolates himself, refusing to be a part of it. If you're watching this video, you probably consume a lot of media. This also means you're used to righteous, heroic protagonists who can do no wrong. So maybe it'll surprise you that less than a minute after you boot up the game, you already get a strong idea of our main character. He's a jerk. Said jerk is Naku Sakuraba, and no, this scene isn't some misinterpretation of his character. He really begins the game like this, and it's something that put a lot of people off of playing it when they booted up their DS's in 2007. I know I was put off at first. You always want to root for the hero, you want them to be likeable so you can cheer them on, especially when you're the one playing them. How are you supposed to root for an antisocial teenager who only cares about himself? And then you realise. You can't lie to yourself. You've been here before. You see this past, or maybe even current version of yourself, staring back at you in the form of Neku, a closed off and confused person who doesn't understand others, who can't make sense of the world around them because everyone's values are so different. And then you look in the mirror, and then you realise, wait, I'm the jerk? Understanding others isn't easy. It doesn't take special powers, but it does take a lot of time and practice. And in Neku's case, it takes the Reapers game. This is a series of tests across a city that takes place over the course of a week. A new mission is set every day. Complete the missions, and not only do you keep your life, but you get returned to you your entry fee. Every participant of the game has what's most important to them taken away in order to enter. Failing the missions means it won't be returned to them, and they'll lose their right to exist entirely. 
The city this Reaper's game is set in is Shibuya, Japan. For those of you who are avid anime watchers or game players, you might be very used to the city by now. From Persona 5 to Alice in Borderland and all in between. Media has a fascination with this city. It's understandable though, the real world location of Shibuya is said to be one of the busiest places in the world with lots of variety in attractions, shops and landmarks in one place, so there's something for everybody. But here, the setting is used in a unique way, exploring how Shibuya draws in all different types of people and how this diverse crowd, all in one place, causes clashes in their values. This means that even though the game is set in Shibuya, you can also relate it to just about anywhere our differences have us collide. These days, that's pretty much everywhere. I'm from a small coastal town where not so much happens, but even I find myself thinking, Oh look, there's some graffiti on that wall. It's just like Twiwi. All Reaper's games also take place in the underground, or Yuji. In simple terms, they're an alternate plane of existence layered on top of the real ground, or RG. People in the underground can see the real world and even read the thoughts of the people there, but not the other way around. Unfortunately for Neku, he has to work together with the other players to complete the various challenges thrown at him. He doesn't get a choice in the matter, because this Reaper's game requires you to team up with another player to form something called a partner pack. It's the only way players are able to face each day's challenge. The first to approach Neku and form a pact with him is Shiki Masaki, a girl who's eager to escape the Reaper's game to continue chasing her dreams of going into fashion design. She's friendly right from the start, praising Neku for being a psych whiz and trying to get him to open up. In various ways. Shiki's also overly optimistic, fully believing they'll survive the Reaper's game. Of course, there are reasons behind this positivity. The main being unresolved trauma. Before long, you get to see a side of her that she hides, her true self. Despite how much she hates this true self, and apparently so does Square Enix, she's actually a beautiful character and means so much to so many people. Her weapon, or her plushie, is Mr. Mew, who's also the mascot of the series. Despite his name, there are some claims that he is a pig. Rhyme is a young girl who's still searching for a dream. She's optimistic like Shiki, but unlike Shiki, she knows what a meme is. She's also more honest, not being afraid to admit the reality of their situation or to tell Beat when he's stepping out of line. Rhyme's cheerful personality is one of the brighter spots of the game, and she's another character who I wish we saw more of. This girl is an inspiration, and I don't understand why they can't do more with her. Justice for girlies who deserve more screen time. Rhyme's partner is Beat, who has some of the most fun dialogue of any game. His character is quite the experience, but beyond that tough guy act is a boy who genuinely cares for the people around him, and he's the first to fight to protect what matters to him. By the end of the story, you'll appreciate him for being so earnest. He really is everyone's big brother, and by the time you get to know him, you'll wish he was yours too. Unlike them though, Joshua, but mother and father call him Joshua, is a thorn in Neku's side. Most known for being on charts with characters who are foils to the protagonist, he's the perfect person to provide a challenge to Neku. Everyone else is getting Neku to open up his world, but Josh has other ways of supporting him. They go on their own fun little adventures together, learning about everything from the meaning of life to capitalism. Underneath all that smirking Josh does though, there's actually a very lonely and incredibly well-written character who grows in his own ways. That's why everyone can't stop loving this crinkled roof seat. Hate to love him, love to hate him. Either way, you'll want to squeeze the life out of him. These are the main five that we get to know the most about. The ones that set challenges for these players in this Reapers game are... The Reapers. Wow, humble, aren't they? But the Reapers are also memorable characters in their own right. They're led by the elusive conductor Megumi Kitaniji, who's one of the overseers of the game. Although he is the one making the game as difficult as it is, he also, like all other Reapers, is under pressure to enforce its rules. Oh look, it's Team Rocket. Uzuki and Karia are two lower ranking Reapers who work together to pose a pretty big threat to the players. They have entirely different personalities though. Karia is a stargazer, preferring to do his own thing most of the time. Uzuki though, is desperate to get a promotion and rise up the ranks. Still, they work well together, because to both of them, a job is a job. 
They work because they have to, and they're trying to get by just like everyone else in the city. There are higher ranking reapers who pose even bigger threats. Yodai Hishigazawa, for example, is a powerful reaper who also wants to be the next Gordon Ramsay. He's really the only one who plays the game by the cookbook, being the best example of a reaper who follows the recipe of the game to its exact ingredients. Um, was that too much? Konishi, on the other hand, is a cold and calculating reaper with a strong track record of getting players out the running, as well as picking up pog charms. Of course, I couldn't talk about the Reapers without mentioning fandom favourite Shomi Namimoto, an 18-year-old prodigy who's quickly risen the ranks to become a formidable force. He often speaks in math terminology, but don't let that fool you, this man can't count to save his life. Like me. No, what you should be afraid of is his power over players, both in the Reapers game and over Tweety fans. He's a fandom favourite, and a favourite of character designer Tetsuya Nomura's too, since his clothes are actually based on a set of Nomura's own. There's one more vital character to mention, Sanai Hanakoma. Not a reaper or a player, but someone else entirely. On the surface, Hanakoma is a chillaxed and supportive barista with some wise words and a love of beans, but looking into his character it's clear he's given up a lot to help the players. You learn the most about him when reading the secret reports, extra journals you collect each day that delve more into the underlying narrative happening beyond the plot of the game, but I'll touch on that another time. What I wanted to get across by introducing some characters is that each of them is so uniquely written, you'll encounter them whilst playing as the most closed off one of them all, but the more you do, the more you realise this was the right choice. Because, regardless of whether we want to admit it or not, a lot of people can relate to Neku. Many people have been in the position that Neku is in, thrown into a scenario so far out of our comfort zone with no choice but to step out of it in order to survive. When Neku takes that first step, he realises the world ends only where he chooses it to. He can remain closed off, only caring about his values, but he can open up his world by trying to understand others. And Tweewee tells you that it's worth every struggle, clash, triumph, and interaction that's needed to do so. Soon, Neku finds value in the world around him, and himself. By the end of the game, you may too. Seeing this closed off person, the person you once were, grow into someone who tries to understand the world and the people around him, it's powerful. But who is behind Tweewee, you may ask? Well, it was the work of several wonderful people at Square Enix. The game originally began life under the title Emotion Edge, first intended to be a rhythm action game. Director Tatsuya Kondo states that the very first project was a bit different from your so-called action RPG. Fellow director Tomohiro Hasegawa continues, saying that Takeshi Arakawa, one of the game's designers, had an original proposal focused on team battles. It was a system in which teams with different ways of thinking fought and competed over territories in the city. That's why Neku and Shiki were initially established as leaders of different teams. And isn't this a really interesting concept? It's different, but it sounds like something they could actually pull off in an amazing way, no? The story, written by current Final Fantasy writer Sachi Hirano, combines some of the best and most memorable and quirkiest dialogue I've read in a game. It's made for a story which has literally helped people move forward in their lives. This whole story is entirely set in Shibuya. It gives it that perfect feeling of being in a place that does give you enough to do in a game, but at the same time, it's just one city. For as great as it is, seeing so much of it makes you feel like you want to see beyond its borders when the game is over. Or maybe you won't get tired of seeing it when it looks this good. And if you haven't seen enough of Tweewee's art in this video, here it is again! If you played Final Fantasy or Kingdom Hearts, you may recognise a bit of this style. That's because the two lead artists are Gen Kobayashi and Tetsuya Nomura. Kobayashi has worked on various other Square Enix titles. Nomura's biggest focus is on Kingdom Hearts, but his iconic style can be seen in the art here. The lines, the colours, the expressions! There's no realism at all, and it's so aesthetically pleasing. I don't want my 4K graphics with visible human skin pores, I want killer frogs instead! What? The majority of Tweewee involves fighting noise, powerful creatures, each based on different animals. You have two strengths to help you defeat the noise. The strength of your partner, of course, but also the strength of your pins, collectible items that each hold different powers. 
You collect a huge variety of them, and Neku, being the psych whiz he is, can use all of them. You can equip six of these pins at a time, and a big part of what makes the gameplay so fun is mixing and matching them to create a power setup that works for you. There's no limit to this either, since there's over 300 kinds to collect. Neku's partner is used in combination with these pins. Together, they perform combos by synchronizing their attacks at the same time. As they work together, a sync meter builds up, which can be activated to trigger a card game. Complete the card game, and your piggy can grow huge so it can shoot lasers out of its eyes. This is where the version differences come in. The DS version of Tweeby uses the dual screens so you control Neku and his partner at the same time. The mobile version of the game, however, has slightly different controls. In this version, there are touch controls, and Neku's partner is summoned using specific gestures instead. By using said gesture, they attack alongside you. This is the same system that's used for the Nintendo Switch version, called Final Remix. This allows the player to attack using the same touchscreen controls in tablet mode. It can also be played with Joy-Cons. Uh, yeah, unless you're one of the three Switch owners whose Joy-Cons haven't drifted yet. Good luck. Please just play handheld if you're struggling. In all of Tweebie's versions, the gameplay experience can be adjusted to make it easier or more difficult. You adjust how difficult enemies are through difficulty settings. The tougher the enemies you fight, the rarer the pins you can get for defeating them are. Though you can increase your chances of getting these rare pins through the leveling system. Your level ranges from 1 to 100, but you can lower or increase it at any time. The lower your level, the less HP you'll have, but the higher chance you'll get of finding rare pins. Some of these pins are meant to be exchanged for money, used to buy food which boosts your stat. Mmm, I'm in paradise. Please, never say that again. As well as different banded clothes that Neku and the others can wear. Because if the characters didn't have enough drip for you, don't worry, Mr. Ducky's got you covered. And their brands are actually significant to the plot. Each area of Shibuya has brands that are trending. Battle using a pin of that brand and you'll be able to change the trends in the area. And this mechanic is really well incorporated. After all, trends are an attempt for people to connect to those around them. I'm sure you've done it before, watched a show, played a game, worn a style, because people are doing the same. You want to know what all the hype is about, but you can also be the one to express yourself and open up to others, allowing them to connect to you by setting your own trends. You'll notice that the rhythm gameplay idea from the original concept of Tweewee, Emotion Edge, is now totally absent. A rhythm game would be perfect for the series, but Tsuiwi tracks have been reduced to cameos in Kingdom Hearts Melody of Memory, Final Fantasy Theatre Rhythm, and surprisingly, Groove Coaster. It got into it with some Undertale tracks. What can I say? Amazing games that make you reevaluate your life with killer soundtracks are always going to find each other. Still, music plays a huge role in setting the game's tone and atmosphere. Composed by Takahiro Ishimoto, the soundtrack is rock, electronica-esque, but also has this otherworldly catchiness to it. It's unlike anything I've ever heard. It might be because of how Ishimoto often binds together various bits of sample music and his previous compositions into his work to create entirely new pieces. There are also a whole host of singers on the soundtrack, so you're usually not hearing the same voice twice. It's hard to describe it what makes it so great, but I just know so many of the songs make my eardrums smile. These songs also randomise whilst you're exploring Shibuya and during battles, so they never really feel repetitive either. And these songs are powerful, so much so they couldn't even fit them all onto one DS cartridge and they had to wait until later releases to add some more songs. A notable music change between versions is actually the end credits song changed from Lullaby For You in the DS version to Runaway in all future releases. I feel obligated to say this, because for as lovely as Runaway is, I can't listen to Lullaby For You without my eyes going. There are various other changes between versions too, but none that affect the game's story. But they are significant enough so that everyone probably has a preferred way of playing this 50 to 20 hour game or watching for 6 hours, because it eventually got a 12 episode anime adaptation, but we aren't quite there yet. The original DS version is a bit of a rare find, but it's the only one that provides the original dual screen combat system. I'm lucky enough to have obtained a copy from my dear, dear partner. Thank you for fueling my hyperfixation! But for those who can't get the DS version, the mobile port, The World Ends With You Solo Remix, is a much more affordable and just as fun experience for the single screen version of the combat and so 
if you haven't gotten solo remakes, I don't think there's a legal way to get it anymore since it's not guaranteed to run on any devices and has been delisted from a lot of shops. But this updated version of the game also carries over to the Switch version, Tweeby Final Remix. This allows you to use Joy-Cons and even hand one to a friend so they can control Neku's partner. If you can get them to work. But the biggest version difference by far is in this Switch version, and it's called A New Day. This is a short scenario that takes place after the main story. You encounter some tough fights and strange happenings in Shibuya. This scenario has people quite divided, but regardless of how much you love or hate it, there's no denying it's important, especially as it connects to the sequel we never even knew could happen. Uh, but before that, so people of the world, I ask those of you who are not fans of Tweeby to put yourselves in the shoes of one for just a moment. I'd like to take you on a turbulent journey with many ups and downs as we enter after its release, Tweewee garnered some positive reception from those who played it. All five of them. For the few people who played it, it really spoke to them in a way no game had before. Still, it remains as it does today, a cult classic. It was popular enough to be released in the West just a year under its Japanese release, but this doesn't change its cult classic status. Square Enix's already established franchises were selling far better than just one single quirky DS title. They have the giant of Final Fantasy behind them, and many of the team behind Tweeby are busy assisting on New Kingdom Hearts projects. Why would they have reason to make a Tweeby sequel? Business is business, and if something wasn't making them the money they need, realistically they won't pursue it. I mean they should have enough, just, just look at all the stuff I bought. A sequel just wasn't sustainable, which made it feel like Square Enix had left the game altogether. Five years after the original game's release though, there was a faint glimmer of hope. What is this? A countdown? From Square Enix? The very same counter that appears in The World Ends With You? Oh my god, it's 2012. So it's been five years since the game came out in 2007. Oh my god, that should be enough time for them to produce enough Kingdom Hearts games to afford a Tweewee sequel. Surely this is it. This is what people have been waiting for. Oh boy, this and Rent a Girlfriend are fighting for top spot on what can do the most damage to Tweewee fans. So this countdown was building up to the mobile ports of the game, Solo Remix. Five years since Square had done anything with Tweewee, and it was to slap it on your phone to say it had games on it. My age wasn't even in double digits at this time, so I was blissfully unaware of how much damage this had done. Sure, Solo Remix was a good port, the graphics and controls were upgraded, it got the game out to a slightly wider audience, but there was nothing new here. The only addition is this cryptic image, saying new seven days, and a girl holding Mr. Mew, who definitely isn't cheeky, affectionately dubbed Hype-chan. Although she was just only a 2D image at this time, she was the one hope we had of a Tweewee sequel. Yeah, the power of 2D images really is something. This still fascinates me to this day. They threw this image in with no context and didn't even respond partially until six years later, when she appeared in a new day in Final Remix. Regardless, 2012 and 13 were actually fairly active years for the franchise. Around the time of Solo Remix, Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance was released for the 3DS. Many of the same team worked on this game, so the Tweebie cast actually makes an appearance twice throughout the course of the story. There are fun details in their cameos, like many of their lines, repeating things they've said within the game, and these Dream Eaters, Pseudo Neku and Beat alike, being modelled after Neku and Beat. At the end of the day though, it can be summed up as just a cameo. Cool new 3D models and making appearances in other series equals new content, but not new games. There was another form of Tweebie content though, an app game called Live Remix. Using the same controls as Solo Remix, but only controlling Neku, players would have to take down a ringleader noise each week. Every player contributed to its defeat, making it a team effort over the week. Although it seems like it was a fun way to have cooperated with others, that's essentially all it was. Without a new story or a large player base, it must have struggled as it lasted barely a year. 
Other than being the first appearance of Coco and some extra pins, it never added anything new. It really felt like the five year wait had just left the franchise in a same state as before. It's been years and the Tweeby comeback that had been thought to have been happening came and went with no fanfare. But this series has so much more to offer. Soon enough, it would get the chance to reach a new generation of fans. The beginning of Tweeby's return was the Switch version titled Final Remix, revealed in a Nintendo Direct mini presentation. This was my personal entry into the world and with you, so I have a particular soft spot for this port. If it wasn't for that Nintendo Direct, I might still not know of the franchise. Something about the game's style just had me instantly hooked, and I had to know more. I still remember getting to finally experience it. Although I was addicted to my DS as a kid, anything but Littlest Pet Shop and Nintendogs was deemed too edgy for me, so I was really 10 years late to the party. Final Remakes did come at the perfect time for me though, and I don't know where I'd be if I didn't play it. This port also began to rise hopes of a sequel just that little bit. Tetsuya Nomura addressed this, stating that, on many occasions, I have been interviewed by both fans and the media who have told me how much they want me to make a sequel for the world with you. We have been looking for an opportunity, and there were times we tried to get it started, but time passed without it ever coming to realisation. There are a number of implications behind this final remix version. In addition to my intention of making this my very last time working with the original game, I think this is the final chance for creating a path to the next step which I've had ideas about since the first launch 11 years ago. Many thanks to everyone for supporting ongoing efforts. After this, it was radio silence for another two years. Although it was nothing compared to the constant burns that earlier fans got, the wait was excruciating. I can say that because I was actually there at this time. Although Final Remix may have been Tetsuya Nomura's last time working with the original Tweewee, this story would be told one last time. I said two years, so, uh, well, if you get 2018, add the two, uh, oh. May 2020, and the artwork for what would have been the Anime Expo cover is revealed. It's an illustration by Gen Kobayashi of the Tweeby characters for an anime convention. Tweeby isn't an anime, it's a game. Unless... The World Ends With You, The Animation, an animated retelling of the same Reapers game. It was a first fresh thing for Tweewee in several years, showing there was faith in the franchise again. Yes, this is a retelling, but this new format means that this important story will be brought to so many more people. It also meant there'd be a bunch more merchandise, making paying my student loan back physically impossible. The anime was hosted by the now deceased Funimation, rest in peace, but this means it's also now available on Crunchyroll. It also has some phenomenal voice acting. None of the original voice cast have returned for the animation project, except Karia for some reason. It is a shame because the few lines that the original cast did for their characters did such a good job. We are talking about the animation here though, and the anime cast do an amazing job. They are all new to their characters, but you can really tell they've been studying up. It's thanks to them we finally have voices for some of their iconic lines. This version of the story is far more condensed, so the game is always recommended over it. Generally speaking though, it's a faithful adaptation, complete with all the emotion, noise, and twister remixes of the original. Since the opening of the anime had to be changed from Teenage City Riot to another remix of Twister, not even a day before the broadcast. The anime was officially revealed in July of 2020, but didn't start until spring 2021, so it was thought the franchise would lay dormant for the rest of the year. That is, until November. Another countdown? The same as Solo Remix. Why is there a phone there? Wait, that's not the same. That's it. No, we've all gone collectively crazy. It's just another port. For Apple Arcade. There's no way it's a sequel. Well, then, this new countdown finished. Neo The World Ends With You coming s- <gasps> Play- oh my god.
What is this? He came as big on the new. Greetings, sheeple of Shibuya, and welcome to a new Reapers game. 14 years after the first, we're going to revisit the UG with a brand new cast of characters, and this was surreal. The year between July 2020 and July 2021 were a blur of Tweeby anime and Neo Tweeby news. I watched and rewatched and rewatched all of the news that came out all three pieces of marketing, because there was hardly any of it. It was their chance to get the franchise out to more people, but instead, the little marketing that was there was all directed to fans of the original game, many of who were probably not following the franchise after 14 years. So even if you had heard of Tweeby before, there's a good chance that you haven't heard that it got a sequel. Admittedly, the game wasn't marketed that much since most of the budget was spent on actually making a good game. This wouldn't be a problem if Square Enix didn't deem it a financial failure and just move on. I could go on and on about this, but I've written an entire academic essay on this topic and it isn't what we're here to talk about. At the end of the day, it's not what matters. Rather, it's the game itself. The first game began with Neku, a conflicted boy who was unknowingly destroying himself on the inside because he couldn't open up. The city around him was diverse, and yet he refused to be a part of it. It was only thanks to the time that he spent in the Reapers game that he learned to expand his world and to trust in others. Near the World Ends With You isn't that game. We see a boy standing in the light, but the city around him, a place that once held so many voices, so many values, is now hollow falling apart before his eyes. This opening is the opposite of the originals, and it's horrifying. All the boy can do is watch on powerless as the city crumbles away before him. With destruction on this level, it's impossible for him to do anything. Right? Wait, what? What just happened? The city is back to normal, as if nothing ever happened. The same boy stands by a tree, searching up things on his phone just like any other day before receiving a text from his friend, suggesting that they meet up. An average day for an average boy. This is new protagonist Rindo, another Square Enix spiky head blonde boy with issues, but at the moment he seems pretty unremarkable. Apart from the whole uh, survivor of an entire city getting erased, uh, details, details. He meets with his best friend Fred, waiting for him outside 104! I mean 104! I mean, wait, 109? No, even though Tweeby could actually use the names of these buildings, 104 will always be 104. Being the great buddy that he is, Fred gives Rendo a Reaper pin, a trendy new pin which has taken the streets of Shibuya by storm, which he then immediately proceeds to drop. Wow, nice going. But before we have time to question, why do those legs look like a crinkled receipt? The two of them are hungry, so Fret asks Rindo, curry or ramen? A simple question on the surface, but Rindo is indecisive about, well, just about everything. <laughs> well, let me tell you Rindo, you shouldn't have left this to me because I'm just as indecisive. Uh, looks like you're gonna starve to death? Rindo's indecisiveness often leads to him turning to the internet for misinformation, but he also relies on his online gaming friend Swallow, who sends him a message after they eat. They connect over an in-universe game called Fango, an augmented reality app where players go around to real-world locations to catch creatures and… yeah, if you're thinking this is a Final Fantasy ripoff of Pokemon Go, you're absolutely correct. Swallow claims that they caught a rare creature at Shibuya Scramble Crossing, which gets Rindo's interest. They've never met in person, and since they're so close to the crossing, Fret encourages them to meet. They leave to try and find Swallow, but some… events happen. Where have I seen this before? With that, Fret and Rindo are both thrown into the Reapers game, but how they got there and the game itself is very different to what Neko and Co experienced three years prior. 
In this Reapers game, the players are split into teams instead of pairs, meaning the storytelling and the gameplay takes a much different approach. Brett impulsively makes Rindo the leader of their group, formerly known as Rindo's team, but soon getting the much less embarrassing name of the Wicked Twisters. But being a leader is not in Rindo's skill set. Leaders guide their team, make tough choices, and know what's best for the majority. Rindo isn't that person. He's not on the self-destructive path that Neku was, but he has no direction or goals in his life. Unable to make his own choices, he just follows the crowd, letting his online searches decide his every day. Besides, hasn't every decision been made already? And it's all there on the internet, contained in the form of a phone in the palm of his hand. It's all been done before, so why should he make a choice when a simple search can tell him what the best choice is? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the internet is now filled with a bunch of spam bots, fake images, and misinformation. So yes, Rindo, maybe it is time to slap you into the Reapers game for some much needed character growth. Fret enters at the same time as him, but he's actually quite his opposite. Stylish and laid back, Fret is quick to find the best in life and make a lot of impulsive decisions. This positive nature acts like a shield for him though, hiding what's actually on his mind. He avoids being genuine because to him, there isn't a point in being yourself. If being yourself only hurts others and yourself, then why should you be yourself? Why not be someone people prefer? Thankfully, the Reapers game does help him a little more with being his actual self. In the middle of an early encounter with the noise, they suddenly hear someone sing the lyrics of the hit song Super Minami Moto World. Yes, not Evil Man, who is definitely not Evil Man, and would never do Evil Man things, is back. Returning not as a Reaper, but a player. His new outfit for this sequel is from the brand Black Honey Chili Cookie, based on a real Japanese clothing brand. I don't want to think of the amount of tax evasion he had to do to get that. He becomes a half member of the group? Because, like always, he does have his own agenda. Despite being the most powerful of them all, he only appears when it's in his best interest. This small team is in desperate need of more members, so enter Nagi Yasui, a college student with the love of the mobile phone game Alestra, and a case of hyperempathy. Nagi understands people a little too well, and it's something that she struggles with. It's not that she finds connecting to others difficult, but it's the constant pressure to do so which makes it tough on her. Whether you find it easy or difficult to understand others, connecting to other people carries a lot of weight, and for Nagi, it's a bit too heavy to carry. She joins the group hoping to escape the Reapers game, and because Minami Moto is there, but throughout it, she realises that connecting with others is worth all the energy that it takes. These four form the initial Wicked Twisters, and although the Twisters are the main focus, there are other groups. Groups that have been clearly trapped within this game for far too long. The Varia Beauties are a group that you'll often have to fight, but despite this, they're one of the more agreeable teams. They're all loyal followers of their leader, Kanon Tachibana, an absolute queen and the most genuine of all Neo's cast. She cares about her team first and foremost, so she makes sure they have enough points to survive. She's had to become a cunning strategist to do so, and she's also highly perceptive of others, having to adapt each time that she goes through the game. But she uses these traits to help others too. Not only is she slightly older than the Twisters, but with how long she's been stuck here, she knows how cruel the game can be. It's because of this that she's able to give them some important advice, particularly to Fret, who sorely needs it from her. She wants her own team to survive, but equally she wants other teams to survive as well hence why she gives them any support that she can. The Pure Hearts are another team who aren't as cooperative, being more interested in getting streamer donations than helping the other teams. Their leader is Motoy Anazawa, a social media influencer who uses his charm to spread, uh, positive quotes? He's a friendly and chatty person, but his influencer status gives him power that he's not afraid to use to his advantage. Fuya is the more reserved leader of the Deep River Society. This group of river enthusiasts are all struggling to survive in the game, usually ending up lowest on the scoreboard and only clashing with teams when they have to. But their ability to work well together as a team is what keeps them alive. Despite using flight not fight tactics, Fuya does lead his team well. Like the first game, the ones who trap them all here are the Reapers. This time though, the focus is on a new set of Reapers. They've come to Shibuya seeking refuge from the neighbouring city of Shinjuku, after it suffers the same fate as Shibuya does in the opening. 
The actual city of Shinjuku does neighbour Shibuya, but it's viewed as more of a refined business district, housing things like the Tokyo government building and several luxury hotels. This gives it a very different atmosphere to Shibuya. That also means that these new reapers are very different to the ones we know. The most notable is Shoka Sakurane. She's a spiteful young girl who's grown bored with the game and is the one that explains the rules to our new players. But after this, she spends her time taking her anger and boredom out on the Twisters. She's fed up of going through the same routine over and over and longs not only to change the game but for more reasons to care about life. One of the few things she cares about comes in the form of Gato Nero, her favourite clothing brand which has recently taken Shibuya by storm. Hey, their mascot looks pretty familiar though. The ringleader of the Shinjuku Reapers is Shiva, who seems to have changed after leaving his old city behind. He's quickly taken control of Shibuya, and the more power he's gained, the cooler he seems to have become. Only his fellow Shinjuku Reapers remember the person that he once was. Like his right hand Hishima, who seems to have a little tension with him. He's far more reserved, but does seem to have very heightened senses, and I like the fact that he seems to be stronger than he lets on. He gets a lot less focused than Shiba, but these two are basically a divorced couple. Their adopted son is Kaye, one of my favourite reapers who runs a fortune telling shop. He's a reaper of few words, who prefers to talk using texts and emojis rather than actually speaking. He helps everyone equally with his fortune telling, and this is exactly what makes him such a great character. Although the focus of most reapers is to defeat players so they can rise to a higher rank, we have had reapers give assistance to players before. It's always great to see when they do help the players, and Kaya is definitely the best example of that. We love a supportive bunny boy. Their other son is Susukichi, a mighty guy with incredible photography skills. <laughs> Sorry, I can't even joke about that. <laughs> <laughs> Highly competitive, he often approaches the Twisters to challenge them for points. In reality, he's the most loyal out of all the Shinjuku Reapers, caring deeply about them and treating them like family, which is why he's the first to notice how much things have changed. He's part of a team called the Ruinbringers, acting as a bodyguard for fellow member... Wait, Hype-chan? Yes, almost 10 years since her cameo in Solo Remix, we finally have a proper name to put to her face, Tsukumi Matsunaya. All this time she's had only two cameos and no name, but we finally see her have an actual role. Though she doesn't have the role that most people thought she would. Unlike fans assumed, she's not the protagonist. In fact, she's an antagonist, standing in the way of the Twisters using Piggy. I mean, Mr. Mew. She's said to have had a much kinder personality, but it seems all but gone. Vanished alongside Shinjuku, leaving her a shell of her former self. Admittedly, I wish they did more with her. I say this because I don't want anyone to go in thinking that all these years of her character being built up is just for her to get less screen time than she deserves. What we see of her makes her likeable, but unlike people have been led to believe, she is far from a main character. Another Reaper who gets less screen time than she deserves is the intimidating Ayano Kamichi, a powerful and sophisticated Shinjuku Reaper who took Shoka under her wing. She's been infatuated with Shoka ever since, to the point where she names her own iguana after her. But she's had the hardest time adapting to Shibuya, relying on Shoka's presence to keep her in the city. Beside this, there are some more characters who return from the original. If you haven't seen these, I won't be the one to spoil it for you. But despite the impact that the returning characters have, this sequel really is dedicated to the new cast and seeing them grow into their own. The message of the first game was to expand your world by learning how to understand others. Neo's focus is on how to understand people, you need to be willing to make your own choices. Making choices is tough, especially because you never know their outcome, and how the outcome will affect you and the people around you. But without making these choices, we'll stagnate, not being able to define ourselves or enjoy things in our lives. This means we're not going to connect with people or the world around us. If we choose for ourselves though, we can not only connect to others, but we can understand and learn to work together with them. I think this is a fantastic decision to take the sequel in. It's close enough in tone to the first game, but it allows it to branch into a different direction in both story and gameplay.
Neo captures what makes the original so timeless and stylish by carrying a similar aesthetic, whilst also updating it all to fit with the more modern setting. In other words, no more flip phones here. I'm looking at you, Josh. Many of the original team returned to make this sequel, including director Tatsuya Kondo. He's joined this time by fellow director Hiroyuki Ito, who previously was a designer on the first game. It's taken over 14 years, but at long last, they've returned to their original idea of teams with different values fighting across the city. And there's something so poetic about seeing things come full circle in the sequel. It's easy to tell by the iconic visuals that the dream team of Tetsuya Nomura and Gen Kobayashi are back, joined this time by Miki Yamashita. Between them, they created some amazing designs for all the key cast members. Another member of the original team who returns is composer Takahiro Ishimoto, and basically made Neo's soundtrack the anthem of my life. Once again, every genre of music under the sun is thrown together to create a soundtrack unlike anything else out there. This includes remixes and entirely new songs. The whole time you're playing, these songs are changing and evolving to fit the current mood. I can't think of any song I don't enjoy at least a little bit. The remixes are great, but what really stands out to me are the new tracks. Like the previous soundtrack, there's loads of artists who feature on this soundtrack. Artist Stephanie Tovlin wrote and sung a few tracks, including Little Things, which is not only my favourite song in the franchise, but my favourite song of all time. I have to actively avoid listening to it because it makes my eyes... Artist Mas Kimura also worked on a few songs here, and he also worked on the lyrics for Astral Chain's three main vocal tracks. I highly recommend you listen to those if you want to hear more of his work. This guy does not miss. And even the English localization lead, Matt Furida, wrote the lyrics to Insomnia and Breaking Free, two of perhaps the most relatable and resonating songs I've ever heard. Speaking of localization, this has been a controversial topic? I won't spend long dwelling on this because it's not the purpose of this video, but I will simply say it as it is. So the story of Nero Tuiwi is mainly written by Aikiko Ishibashi, a writer new to the series who is also working on the as of yet to be released Kingdom Hearts 4. The original story being in Japanese of course meant that it had to be translated, but massive amounts of hate were directed towards this localization, saying it was too inaccurate? I understand wanting an exact translation. You want the right impression of the story and characters. Still, this doesn't mean you can direct hate towards the very thing allowing you to understand the game in the first place. The fact we have localizations is an amazing thing. Frankly, I don't think the characters and story would come across as well as they did if the localizers didn't do such a good job. Every language has its own terms and speech patterns, so one-to-one -one translations are usually impossible and would not get the characters across nearly as well. Communicating the story in the right way in each language is why localization teams are employed instead of just using Google Translate. This localization also allows the English voice cast to truly shine, and the inclusion of voice acting is one of the biggest improvements that Neo has over the first game. There's lots of standouts here, from Paul Castro Jr's accurate portrayal of a boy struggling to bear the weight of his choices. No, come on, not like this! Hang on, I'm having some serious deja vu. This happened before. To Miranda Parkin's incredibly silly and peridot inspired sounds. My worst ever review! So edgy! Tis I, Nagi the Edge Lord! Even more minor characters have great voices, like Susukichi, voiced excruciatingly well by Max Adele. It's clear he literally broke his voice trying to reach this high pitch. You kids must be the newbies! Oh, fresh out of the box, ain't ya? Mm? Mm? Oh, -ho! oh ho! You hear a lot of this voice acting through the battles too, and if I had fun with the first game's gameplay, the Neo's gameplay is so fun it makes me lose over 250 hours to it. The different difficulties and unique leveling system return. Similar to the first game, there are over 300 pins with unique powers, and this is even more impressive than the original because combat is entirely in 3D. There are still 2D sprites, but battles are now changed to 3D models. The focus in Neo is on team-based combat, so you always have full control of your party. You equip them each with pins that have corresponding buttons. 
all you need to use your pins is to press the button. This is what makes the combat so fun. Using several pins at the same time allows the combat to have a lot of depth. There's endless opportunities for skilled combos, particularly if you can get the timing right. That doesn't sound like your speed? Well, it's not mine either. Luckily, there is another option. Button mashing. The sync meter returns, but works differently here. Instead of using cards to determine damage, the damage relies now on... Other great additions to Neo include all the new things to collect and unlock that are new to the game. This includes a social system where you can get useful abilities, and I highly recommend you do this during the main story. I love this idea, and I think saving it for the sequel was absolutely appropriate. Being closed off as he is, Neku didn't make any connections unless he had to. Rindo doesn't have this problem. He's willing to understand others, and he needs the power of those connections to make his own choices. The further you progress in the game, the more challenges you also complete. For each you complete, you get a piece of graffiti to decorate your own graffiti wall with your achievements. This graffiti wall actually shows up on the back wall of Udagawa, and yeah, honestly, this is just a really cool idea. Of course, threads are back. The system of each area having its own trending brand is actually absent but there's now many more places to shop, so many more stylish outfit designs, and just like the first game, you can dress any party member in any type of outfit. There are no silly restrictions here. You can also increase your party stats with food, and this time, you feed each party member at the same time. Not everyone enjoys the same food though. Some absolutely hate the taste of canned air, or if you're Nagi, you might love the taste of grilled alligator. It's super fun discovering the reactions each party member has to these meals. But they say that people can survive for a month without food, so to buff yourself for the lowest price, get some of that affordable refill coffee. Each member also has a latent ability, which provide unique elements to the gameplay. Fret's ability is called Remind. Use when you need to... um... Oh, yeah, oh, when you need to remember something. This involves moving pieces of an image back into place using joysticks. If you know anything about Fret though, giving him an ability called Remind, that's a pretty cruel move. Nagi's ability, Dive, allows him to dive into people's minds to erase the noise in them. These battles have different conditions, like HP drains or stronger enemies, to reflect how the characters are feeling. These segments aren't only unique, but they capture different emotions so well. And there's only one I found particularly tricky. Rindo's ability, Replay, is more closely tied to the story. This allows you to revisit moments of each day to alter events that occurred and change them in your favour. When you think about Rindo's personality, this ability all makes sense. When you struggle to make your own choices, what would be best? Well, going back in time to change the outcome of your choices to make them more favourable. It's every indecisive person's dream. This format of revisiting certain events definitely allows the story to be more expansive than the first. The main story is about 35 hours, almost double the length of the first game. The story is always moving forward thanks to the focus on missions and the character moments. Though Neo works as a standalone game, it's really intended to be a sequel, set three years after the first game. If only we waited three years for it in real life. You can treat it as a half sequel. Think Tears of the Kingdom to Breath of the Wild, or AI Nirvana Initiative to AI Somnium Files, especially since the focus is on the new characters. But it's so much more satisfying if you played the original. Its themes and aesthetics are all similar to the first, but it builds upon them, approaching how we understand people from a different angle. Every moment of our lives makes it clear that no person could be more different from the other. But these days, there's so little out there that tells us that these differences don't have to be a barrier to connecting. But this is at the heart of The World Ends With You. The unfolding plot, the underlying narrative, every character, the mechanics, even their songs in their lyrics and tone. These elements together all form the core message of both games. The understanding people is not only possible, it's fundamental to our lives. You'd think that because of this, these games are focused on the idea of a collective mindset, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Because these games are entirely focused on individualism. The idea that we each have something special and important to bring to the world. And by connecting over the things that make us different and unique from one another, we can make a better world for ourselves and for others. Connecting with others doesn't just benefit them, it benefits you as well. These stories aren't afraid to tell you how difficult connecting is though. 
The struggles each character has with reaching out to one another due to their differences makes that clear. Every person is different. Everybody resonates with different things. I probably said some things in this video you might not resonate with, and that's just a small proof of it. But this series not only celebrates those differences, it tells us that they are a way to connect. By connecting through our differences and our similarities, we can not only make the toughest of choices, but open up our worlds and make them endless. Our worlds have no end, only a beginning, and they begin with us. <laughs>